My name is Rosa Figueroa, and I am one of the Unified Family Court judges in Miami-Dade County. I want to welcome you all to this subject that I think is very timely. Now there's a lot of interest in this, in this concept. The learning objectives today, as you see on the, on, on the webinar, are going to be understanding the concept of court culture and how court culture impacts the experience on litigants that come before the court system identify and understand the specific court culture within the, uh, your own jurisdiction, and applying an understanding of neutrality as it applies to domestic violence cases. Next, next slide, please. So I'd like to begin by going to the next slide, which talks about what is culture. So I think that when we generally think about culture, we, we think about it in the terms of what our cultural identity is, um, whether you happen to be Hispanic, Anglo, African-American. So it's usually along um, things that identify us. But I think that we're all familiar with the concept of court culture as it also applies to the culture, for example, of the Northeast, of the South, of regional. And certainly that applies to our work life as well in the legal community. So you can have the, cult, the, the culture of what it's like to work for DCF, um, the public defender's office, the state attorney's office. Um, and that culture can be defined and changed according to the regions of the state that we're in um, and whether we're in a rural area as opposed to an urban setting. And if we go to the next, uh, slide, you see that the way that culture is defined is a belief system, norms, uh, traits, either in a religious or religious um, social group, but it's generally speaking a set of shared attitudes and values and goals that characterize a, a particular institution or organization. So when we talk about the culture in our courtrooms, not only are we talking about the culture of perhaps a dependency court as opposed to criminal court where the issues are going to be different, right? We have dependency court that the emphasis is on therapeutic services. Um, so the whole culture and attitudes and goals are gonna be different as opposed to a criminal court where you have an adjudication and accountability of um, given a certain act right there was a criminal a, an act that's alleged to have been criminal and the whole court culture is going to be around determining what the facts are and then a proper adjudication of that and certainly that's different than in family which is basically the three areas that we deal with when we're adjudicating these kinds of cases but we also need to focus if we go to the next slide on the fact that the culture is not only determined by the courtroom setting the cases that we're dealing with and the regions that we're dealing with, but it's certainly set up by the group of people that are inside the courtroom. So we all know that if you practice in front of one judge, the court culture is going to be completely different than if you practice in another judge. And obviously that's going to depend on different areas as we weave through the, um, the, the uh, a division and, and think about all the facets in which a domestic violence case can be set up. So not only is the cult culture determined by the place that we're in, the kind of case we're adjudicating, um, but it's also determined by the mix of the people that are in the courtroom and what their attitudes are um, with regards to the issues that come before them. So what is bias in the next slide? I think generally when we, because, and I think it's important to realize that when we talk about a culture and determining and trying to formulate what would be a neutral culture in which we are adjudicating cases of domestic violence, we need to realize that we all have biases, right? Um, everybody has biases depending upon who they are and what their experiences are. And biases aren't necessarily bad or good, they just are. Um, so, for example, I have a bias against the Newark airport because I fly in and out of there a lot and my experiences have generally not been all that good. It may not be bad because that means that I get there insanely early to the airport in order to avoid any issues. Where it would become an issue is if I am a transient and thinking that my bias is facts and that there's never going to be a good, a good experience in that setting. So, biases are just if we go to the next slide, um, an inclination 
uh, prejudiced, a bent, or a tendency to seeing something. Okay, next slide. The reason why these issues are important is that we are adjudicating, when we talk about culture and neutrality and bias in the setting of domestic violence cases, we are dealing with some of the most intimate aspects of a person's life because we're dealing with the intimacy of their family. And certainly every family has a different culture, even if the families look the same. Um, and the culture of that family can be completely different than our own culture or our own experiences. So when we approach these cases and, and, and we're approaching an area of family life that traditionally has so much taboo and secrecy and shame, um, and fear attached to it, it's important that we approach it not only from a view of culture as to what the litigants look like, but an approach as to what our individual biases are and, um, and noting the differences that can be created in, in a courtroom. Because what we're really striving for is to be fair and impartial. If we can go to the next slide, please. So I got a question mark by the NYU because try as I might to look where I found this, this quote, I wasn't quite able to find it, find it. But when I first prepared this presentation, um, I Googled what is a fair and impartial court because that's what we all strive for. And we're certainly striving that in as we adjudicate these kinds of cases. And I think we can all agree that the they're, they're high aspirations, right? That really apply to all the areas that we adjudicate. Um, it's the legitimacy of the court depends on the belief that the judges are gonna be fair, that there's going that you're gonna be able to walk into a courtroom, that there's gonna be no bias or favor, um, that regardless of what a person look likes or what their wealth and connection is, you can have a fair day in court. And just to further reiterate the importance of that and the importance that we place on that. Um, yeah, I'd like to play a clip from an interview that was conducted for Frontline. It was called, um, the next slide, Justice for Sale. And it was conducted by Bill Moyer and he interviewed it, interviewed, I'm sorry, Justices Breyer and Kennedy. So at the time of the interview, Breyer and Kennedy are talking about campaign finances and its impact on the impartiality of the court system. But really what they talk about our universal truths that we really all adhere to um, for people that labor in the judiciary and, 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 and all our participants, and that it is true and important in any kind of case, including cases dealing with domestic violence, where the quality of life of children um, is at stake. So if we can play that. And independence doesn't mean you decide the way you want. Independence means you decide according to the law and the facts. And pretty soon you'll have a, a, a clash of political interests. Now that's fine for a legislature. I mean, that's one kind of a problem. Uh, but if you have that in the court system, you will then destroy confidence that the judges are deciding things on the merits. And if people lose that confidence, an awful lot is lost. Uh, I do not think uh, that we should select judges based on a particular philosophy as opposed to temperament, commitment to judicial neutrality, and commitment to other more constant values as to which there is general consensus. I mean, isn't the verdict in from the people that they cannot trust the judicial system there anymore? This is serious because the law commands allegiance only if it commands respect. It commands respect only if the public thinks the judges are neutral. And when you have figures like that, the judicial system is in real trouble. First of all, you have Kennedy pointing out, next slide please, that the law commands allegiance only if it commands respect. And the respect is only there if there's a belief that the judges are neutral. So inherent in that is a belief that the judicial system is impartial, that there's neutrality, that the culture of the court is one of trying to excavate what the truth is. And then if we go to the next slide, we have Breyer indicating that independence doesn't mean you decide the way you want, but independence means that you decide according to the laws and the facts. Next slide. So what we're going to be dealing when we talk about cultural 
um, sensitivity to domestic violence uh, cases and neutrality is really trying to excavate what does it mean to decide based upon the law and the facts. Next slide, please. So what we, the, the law part is easy, right? Um, we know that you don't commit violence in, in, in a family setting and you can, and you can apply that whether you're in the family setting, in a family court, in the dependency court where, um, where the focus is so much on children um, and so as it is in the family court and certainly in the criminal aspect as well. But finding the truth is what can be difficult at times. So in order to start examining how we find the truth in one of those cases, I want to play you another clip. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please, which is um, talking about privilege and the privilege and how that plays into the way that we view things and how our worldview is. So I don't know if any of you have been participants of a privilege walk or know what a privilege walk is. Um, this is a clip that shows people going through a privilege walk. It's pretty abbreviated. People are born into families where they have to walk miles just to get water. All I have to do is turn on a faucet. That's privilege. If you have ever tried to change your speech, if you were embarrassed about your clothes or how if you I think privilege is when um, some people have some things and other people don't have things. I feel privilege is something that you don't even really have control over. I think it'd be silly for me to say I don't have a fair amount of privilege considering like the country I live in and the job I get to do and the college I was allowed to go to. I suppose being a white male will help me end up somewhere towards the front, but I'll take a few steps back from being gay. I don't think I'll make it to the front. I think I'll maybe be in the middle. That's just a gut feeling I have. If your parents work nights and weekends to support your family, take one step back. If you can show affection for your romantic partner in public without fear of ridicule or violence, take one step forward. If you are embarrassed about your clothes or house while growing up, take one step back. If you have ever been diagnosed as having a physical or mental illness or disability, take one step back. If you have ever been bullied or made fun of based on something you can't change, take one step back. If you get time off for your religious holidays, take one step forward. If you came from a supportive family environment, if you can see a doctor whenever you feel the need, if you are able to move through the world without fear if of you took out loans assault, for your education, if there were more than 50 books in your house for so these are your final positions. I think it felt kind of strange for everyone. It's a hard thing to discuss or even reflect on. It was very awkward. I think when you can represent it so visually like this and so immediately, it definitely takes on a new um, I think we were like all joking around in the beginning. It was pretty lighthearted. And as soon as the questions started coming in, the mood shifted immediately. And we all kind of, it was just silent. Just looking back and seeing like a bunch of people behind you is not a good feeling. It's like weird how you want to like hold on to explaining a certain privilege. Like, oh, but that's not actually me because like I had to work really hard for that. So it's, it's weird to like take a step forward when you feel like you're taking a step forward with someone else. But you wear a lot of the baggage of like how those things were hard. It was like more emotional than I thought it would be. It reminded me of when they talk about slavery in high school and you feel like angry for a few days, but then you just realize like, this is how it is. For me, it was kind of frustrating almost to look back and see how much further some people were behind me and realizing that, you know, a lot of that stuff, no amount of hard work or even legislation can make up that gap. It's, it's interesting being an Asian American because you kind of, you're not really sure where you fall on the spectrum of privilege. I know that for me, the, one of the reasons I ended up so far back was that there are questions around safety as an African American, as a woman, as a, as a gay woman. Um, there are just so many different ways that I don't feel safe. I feel like I just learned to be grateful for what you have. You know, we're in such a huge society where it's always complaining about what you don't have. It just shows you that for some families, like each family, you're meant to do better. My grandparents did good. 
my parents did good and I'll do even better. I, I do think if you're not like aware of privilege, you should do this exercise, but it's more complicated. So the, the reason why I play this, and if we were in a different kind of setting, it's always interesting to have um, groups break out and kind of share what you get from this. And why do I bring up this video? Why is societal privilege talked about so often now as we're tackling the issue of cultural bias, especially in the context of domestic violence? Um, because these are the kinds of emotions and these are the kind of issues that we that not only the people that comprise the courtroom setting and the culture of the courtroom setting are dealing with, but also the people that come before us are dealing with. And that's not even addressing the added issues that are inherent in a case of domestic violence that it's going through the system. So yes, it is very emotional. And not only did you hear the, the participant in, um, point that out, but several of the people pointed out. You can see how there are times in the video that people start and they're holding hands and then as the issues of privileges or, or the lack thereof makes people split up. Um, it's often an eye opener as to things that we take for granted just because they are who we are, are inherently factors that have allowed us to reach certain goals. Um, it's interesting how innumerable, many times you'll have people like the woman that's expressing frustration to say, yeah, but to get that privilege, I had so many obstacles to go over. So when we talk about societal privilege and when we talk about it in the context of the courtroom setting, we're talking about the ability of people and the wherewithal of people to overcome certain issues, to address problems in their life. Right. So we're talking about people that may have access to a court um, that may have the education to be able to go to the court. They may have the finances to go to a court um, that that. Um, and we're also talking about other participants that may have of this court setting and of this culture of this culture of the courtroom that may have privileges that make it difficult to understand someone else. So when they're starting in the privilege walk, everybody's kind of joking around and everything's good. And, you know, maybe you don't look the same way as we do, but we can all kind of come together. But when it gets into the nitty gritty of all these other aspects that have to happen, um, you start seeing the differences. Um, and, and you see how that can impact your ability to really come to an understanding and how many things are there about the people that come before us or the people that even we work with on a daily basis that we don't um, that we don't view. Okay, and so we have another um, comment that says, "Probably feel sad, whether privileged or not privileged. I think everyone would like to believe they didn't have a head start in life, but would be proud if they overcame lack of privilege." Right, right, and and that's why I I put on here too. Privilege is not necessarily a dirty word. I think. Um, you know, one of the things about our country is right there. There's like this this concept of we all work hard and we get to where we are. Privilege doesn't necessarily mean that things were easy or not, or that you have to excuse or make an excuse for what you for what you have. It just means that that's who you are. So when privilege becomes an issue is when you're not aware of it and you're in a courtroom setting adjudicating cases about the intimacy of a family and not being aware of the fact that your particular experience for which you don't really have to apologize for may skew the way that you're viewing a case that comes before you. And that's when we have to really be careful. So it really means that regardless of how hard or easy it was, you had the ability to come and 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 address whatever ailed your family or, or or to be able to come to the issue. So what does all of this have to do with eliminating cultural bias in the courtroom? It's not just about looking at the participants, thinking about whether we're in a diverse community, and certainly those are aspects of it, right? But whether we live in a diverse community and we have to deal with uh, interpreters, whether there's security in the courtroom, um, whether you have an advocate or not, which are all important issues. If you really want to 
eliminate cultural bias in the courtroom and create a culture of neutrality and unbiased adjudication of cases. It's not just about them, it's about us as well. It says, I think about the issue of privilege as it may impact how one is treated by the court or by a jury. Is there authentic equality under the law? And that's what we're trying to address. Absolutely. And, that, and that's the issue that we're going to be addressing during this, right? Is that inherent bias and privilege such that the culture in the courtroom does not lend itself to address a case of domestic violence in a neutral fashion where we're really determining what are the facts? Or is the privilege skewing the way that we're looking at the facts so that the application of the law is not truly justice? And can we do that in a domestic violence case and still remain neutral in the case so that we're not we're not showing bias one way or another? My answer to to that obviously is yes, and I believe very strongly in that. And not only that, I believe that it's imperative. And why is it imperative? Because we're dealing with the lives of children and we're dealing with with the lives of families. And depending on our ability to see the truth and be able to recognize our own sense of privilege and bias. So in order to create a culture of neutrality in the courtroom, um, uh, it, it's imperative that, that we be able to address these issues. So I want to begin then by looking at some of the facts of domestic violence. Because domestic violence is an issue which I think is not really understood very well oftentimes, and there's a lot of myths about domestic violence. So who are the victims of domestic violence? And disproportionate numbers are women. Um, if you look at any statistics on, on the reports of domestic violence, they are generally speaking in the vast number of cases women. Um, there, it, it was a, it's a little bit dated now, but the numbers really haven't changed all that much. If anything, there's, there's, there's more reporting of, of it as, as the issue is gaining more or has gained more acceptance. But um, in the Orlando Sentinel, there was an article that quoted the U.S. Department, Justice Department is reporting that women are three times more likely to be victims of domestic violence than men. And 91% of spousal abuse victims that reported it to the National Crime Survey were women. Um, if you look at the website with regards to um, the National Domestic Hotline, you see these statistics as well. Once again, you see that the overwhelming number of people or victims of domestic violence are women. So that's not to say, I, and look at this, one in four women, one in seven men are victims of severe physical violence by an intimate partner. Um, three in 10 women or 29% of women um, compared to 10% of men are experiencing rape, physical violence, and stalking. Um, most uh, victims of domestic violence report pre previously being victimized by the same offender. And between 1994 and 2010, four and five victims of intimate partner violence were women. So obviously that's not to say that it doesn't happen in situations where men are involved, but the vast majority of women in spousal relationships are, uh, of, of victims of spousal uh, violence are women. And that's not to mean that there isn't violence done by women. I think recently there is more of an acceptance of talking about this. Um, previously, it was shied away from in order not to blame the victim. But when we talk about battery in the domestic violence um, context, we're talking about ongoing physical punishment in combination with emotional, verbal intimidation, economic abuse that's meant to to control or degrade the victim. We're not talking about an episode of violence. And when you adjudicate these cases, if you really want to adjudicate them based upon neutrality and an examination of what the facts are that are affecting this family in order to set up your parenting plan or know whether there's gained insight or, or a case plan if you're in a dependency setting, Context of the violence is everything. If you're not looking at the at the context of the violence in which it was used, but you're not being 
be able to put aside your own biases or prejudices. What was the question? The question was, do you think that men who are the victims of violence are treated differently in DV cases by the judicial system? That's a hard question to, to pose because like I said, it depends on what is being termed violence. If it's, if, I think that there has been a reluctance to view the violence perpetuated against a man as being um, that of fear, right? Oh, well, you can't tell me that you're not really afraid of her. Um, but I think that it has to be dealt it, it, and, and when you're dealing with domestic violence, and that's what I'm trying to really focus on, um, it's a very, it's an area of the law that requires a lot of careful examination. So are they dealt differently or not? I would have to tell you that that would depend on the circumstance. Was it a circumstance where the woman was using uh, violence in order to control, intimidate, degrade him? Um, if he's not being dealt with, as a victim, then yeah, he wasn't dealt with fairly. Was it a situation where uh, they started a verbal argument and she pushed or threw a shoe or th something at him? And is that being dealt with in the same manner as the violence of, uh, of, of a woman who perhaps is having her underwear examined um, when she comes home to make sure that she's not out with other men? Um, the context of the violence is everything. And I don't think that you can really answer that question without knowing the context in which it was done. And up until now, I don't know that there has been, generally speaking, an examination of the violence in the context that it's happening. And I think that's where the movement is now, to really examine it, be able to be open to the fact that a woman can use violence, but then be able to examine it when you're adjudicating these cases. What else do we know about domestic violence? And these again are facts. Um, we know that uh, victims of domestic violence suffer PTSD and the effects of domestic violence uh, of the PTSD can be difficulty sleeping, angry outburst, um, tense, looking like you're on edge, uh, trouble remembering things, having negative thoughts, depression, not trusting, uh, having low self-esteem. So you could have a victim of domestic violence that might portray herself as being a hyper vigilant or a helicopter mom, having no trust, not wanting to follow the parenting plan. 90% of women that, um, that are victims of domestic violence suffer from drugs and alcohol. They self-medicate in order, in order to deal with the violence and, and what's happening. And there are also myths of domestic violence associated with children, right? Well, the child wasn't there. I, I, the, the child wasn't there. Um, the child was in another room. There's no effect on the child. There's a growing body of science that is documenting the effects of domestic violence on children. More than 15 million children in the United States live in homes where domestic violence has happened at least once. Kids are at a greater risk of having, fu of having future violent relationships that are just exposed to domestic violence. When you look at, um, at the brain scans of children that are growing up in a home of domestic violence, you see the difference in the brain scans because these children are in a flight or fright stage the entire time. You see here, girls are six times more likely to be sexually abused than boys are. So, so these, are, these are the facts of domestic violence. Now, is this gonna be present in every single case that you have? No, but if you're not open to the fact that this is a fact, this is documented, this is science, um, these are statistics that are reported, um, then you are skewing your view of the facts and you avoid being able to really view the case as it is. And here we talk about other issues that we see in the children. So you, you could see a child that um, in kindergarten, if you're doing dependency cases that we get so much information about children, they're, they're not sitting still in the classroom. Um, they could have a lot of stomach aches. You could have a four-year-old that starts bedwetting right away. So these are facts that we have and that we know that that's part of the culture or, or, or what domestic violence does to families and does to people. But what we're here today is to determine how we create a culture in the courtroom where we don't have these questions about whether a man was treated differently than a woman, hopefully, right? That we have and we create an atmosphere where the courtroom culture 
is open to viewing the facts of the case, knowing that these things are out there, and then trying to make a determination as to whether this case in particular in front of you is a case where the, is it just an episode where there was an episodic violence, which is not good, but that's going to be adjudicated differently than a case in which whether the actual violence is being used or not, there is control and intimidation and a, and a, um, an inhibition of one parent to be able to parent and provide a safe household for the child because of the acts of another one. So um, in generally speaking, within that context also, these are some other issues that we deal with within the cult, cult, court culture, right? Not only may we have diverse communities or not, there could be in an urban area or not, you may not have as many transportation issues. That's questionable if you live in Miami-Dade County, but, um, but you may, right? There could be lack of services, lack of attorneys, underfunded court systems, and heavy dockets. So this would comprise generally how we spoke about in the beginning, what the court system culture is. And of course, if you live in a diverse community or not, then you would have, those are the people that are inside the courtroom that are helping you make up what it is to be in that courtroom and how, how these cases are being adjudicated. In addition to that, we're going to be dealing with the population that's coming before us. And this is not even necessarily talking about domestic violence participants, right? So even the people that are going to use our facilities may have, like we said before, issues with finances, lack of attorney, the lack of knowledge of what to do, language, education, religious, social pressures, all these different kinds of issues that um, are being presented in the court system and in the culture of the court system that have needs that have to be met. And then we have the fact that we have litigants that are different. So regardless of whether you, leave, you live in a diversified community, there's still going to be differences among the communities, either along religious lines, ethnic uh, lines, uh, issues of privilege or non-privilege. And that could change whether you're in North Florida or South Florida and what kind of access you have to service and the economics and education. So when we talk about this, and then we have to add the facts that we know about domestic violence, right, to all of these tape of, of, of all these issues. So when we talk about neutrality and having a cult, court culture that promotes um, an unbiased way of looking at these cases. I think it's important that we take into account the facts that we know about domestic violence, that we take into account the fact that we have a cult, court culture that has to deal with these issues so that it's not just the issue of the translator or the security, which are important aspects, but that we are also fomenting and developing a court, court culture that is open to all these things that we know about domestic violence. Now, does that mean that every case that you have in front of you is domestic violence? No, but what it does mean is that you are purposely trying to create an atmosphere in the courtroom, knowing that you make up a, a certain focus of the case, knowing that the courtroom experience is made up of different experiences of the people, knowing that you have certain biases, um, uh, certain privileges that may be different from the people in front of you and that all those people come from it from a different wa walk of life and they create an atmosphere where you can really excavate what the truth of that case is that you can really examine with an allegation of violence knowing facts about domestic violence whether this is the particular case that falls within or, or in what range that case falls in? Is it a case where it was just an episode of violence? Is it a case and, and you can address the issues of custody and parenting in that context? Or are there more pervasive issues? Is the addiction or the use of alcohol um, the only issue in the case? Or are you missing the true facts of the case because there's underlying issues of, of um, violence in the case that isn't coming to the forefront because you're not able to look at it that way. So recognizing these differences, not only in the litigants before us, but in ourselves and the differences in the case, 
is what promotes a culture in the courtroom that is sensitive to domestic, domestic violence issue and promotes the neutrality and the fair and impartial adjudication of the cases that we heard speak about by the justices and, 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 and the goals that we aspire to do. Um, and it's recognizing the, these differences because I think that all of us involved in this case want to do the right thing. We want to know what the truth is. And if you don't know what the facts are or if the facts are skewed a certain way because of your own inherent biases or privileges or lack of understanding of what the challenges are and what the reality of, is of the people that come before us, um, then we're not really applying the law to the facts. We're applying the laws to what we think the facts are. And that's what can lead to, um, to creating an atmosphere that's not fair and wholesome for the children that may be involved in these cases. So recognizing our differences creates an atmosphere where the exposition of the truth is cultivated, where there really is neutrality, being aware of the issues of, of domestic violence, the facts of domestic violence, um, so that you can really examine the case, knowing what the facts are and not based upon your own biases. You can have an honest exposition of the truth so there's accountability um, without which there's going to be no redemption, there's no growth, because we always have to remember that even if there's a finding of domestic violence, the perpetrator of the crime very often is the same little boy that in dependency court is coming in and being removed from mom because dad is beating mom, right? So we, the, 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 the goal is to create an atmosphere and a culture in the courtroom where we can excavate that so that all the parties, or we offer the opportunity to all the parties to, to grow and to heal. Um, and, it, and, and it's not a barrier. That's how I believe that we get justice. So, um, you know, Gandhi, right? Who can, who can argue with Gandhi? Have a bias toward action. Let's see something happen now. Um, take small steps in whatever your courtroom experience is, in whatever court culture you are, in whatever part you play in creating the court culture where there is a cultivation and an awareness of oneself and everybody around ourselves, where we can know what our biases are and have a check on it so that we really start penetrating to see what the truth of the litigants are in front of us. Um, and if we're going to take any side, you know, we, you know, we don't want to take sides, right? Well, I, I would urge you that you do take a side. And if I can get to my little cartoon, um, you take the side to ensure safety, right? I, I always like this cartoon. I hate taking sides. Well, you, you, you do need to take a side. You need to take the side to be proactive in being aware of the facts of domestic violence. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're an advocate, right? There's a role for the advocates. If, if that's your role, that's fine. But if that is not your role, um, that you're aware of it so that you can be aware of what the facts are, what your biases are, and that you can try to promote mm -hmm. neutrality. So that's it for me. I understand that we can have a question and answer period. Yes, and there is actually a question um, that was sent in while you were speaking, and it is how does gender bias impact credibility of women victims slash female judges, et cetera? I'm not sure what, um, can, you, can you explain that? I can read it again and I'll wait for this. For, yeah, uh, I think it's Claudia. For, I'll wait for her to um, add more. Yeah, she wants it. Okay, it says, how does gender bias impact credibility of women victims or female judges, etc.? Okay, so I don't know if, if, if the question there is designed towards whether the, the female judge might have a bias against the victim because of gender bias, like the... the and I'm, I'm a little bit unclear as to what the nature of the question is designed, but if it's as to whether the judge herself is going to have a bias against the female victim, it's just like anything else, right? I mean, the judge is going to have certain biases because the judge is not going to be different than anybody else in the courtroom, whether it's the judge, the DCF worker, the defense lawyer, the prosecutor, the police officer, everyone is going to have a bias. And I think that you can't get away from recognizing that people have biases.
people have tendencies and people have prejudices. Um, and what the work is and what, what the emphasis now and, and um, you know, seminars and cultures like this are sprouting out all over. I can't tell you how, how many of these I'm involved with, um, is being able to identify the fact that we do all have bias, and, but you don't stop there. Right. And we do all have privilege and that and that's not a dirty word. It's just who you are. It's recognizing who you are and then saying, OK, so if I'm committed to doing this work and the reason why I got in this work is that I want to do justice to families. And generally, well, I happen to do dependency work right in family. So a lot of my work is involving children. But whether you're doing um, straight dependency work where where there's so much emphasis on the on the on the kids because you're so involved with the kids or you're doing family where you're a little bit more removed you're trying to do the right thing and I think that there has to be a recognition that you can't do the right thing unless you recognize what your what your biases are and then you work against them document yourself so that when a case is coming in front of you whether you have a bias or not against the litigant, you can say, wait a minute here, let me really listen to what, um, or let me really look at what I'm hearing so that I can try to make the best decision I can given the information that I have. I don't know if that answers the question. Well, I, I think that there's a, a different culture going on now um, where the there's, there's hopefully going to promote more honest discussions. Um, and a greater and more careful examination of when these issues come forward. Because like I said, you, 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 you know, sometimes I, I, it's not that you become an advocate one way or another. What you do have to become for is an advocate for the truth. Um, because what you have to become is an advocate for a fair and impartial application of the law to the facts. And you can't have that if you're not looking at your own biases and prejudices and um, and be willing to have honest communications about these issues, even if it's in the courtroom, right? Um, so I, I know that from my own view, if, if I have a worry, I'll, I'll try to say it. Listen, I, I'm, I'm concerned that I'm seeing this. Am I wrong or am I right? Um, I don't understand this. Uh, tell me about it so that I can understand it. Now, once again, I, I do most of my work, well, I, I do some fair amount of family cases also, but um, in dependency work, you, you really do have to get into the nitty gritty of a family functioning, right? Um, but generally, I, I, I think that it's a better adjudication of the case if, if you really do, you, you show a healthy respect for the culture of another family, because even a, I happen to have a very big family, I can tell you that each nuclear family, although we're all very similar, we're all very different as well. And what works in my household does not work perhaps in my brother's household because the cultures are different. So I think that having a healthy respect and curiosity about, about the effect without losing the, the context in which you're laboring in the judicial system is is imperative that it be done if we're really going to get to the truth and adjudicate these cases and and try to create a better life for the families we try to serve. How do you ensure that checking your bias doesn't create another bias? That's such a personal issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's an individual part. And, and I think just being open to the process is how you do that. Right. So if I know and I, and I will tell you, there's not a day in court that doesn't happen that I go, oh, here comes this one again. Right. Whenever I find myself doing that, I stop and I ask questions. And then I try. And I think that's what we we're all supposed to do. Right. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Believe me, you have no idea sometimes the internal narrative that's going on. But but I, and, I, and I think that that's OK. That's OK, because obviously I'm making those assumptions based upon my experiences. Right. But I have been pleasantly surprised. I've been pleasantly surprised. So, all right, well, thank you all very much. Um, and I hope that you will continue to look into this area.